perhaps did we want to maybe start with Amin and then we can work that out while we keep going? Okay, fine with me. Okay, then um, welcome to session four, the modeling languages and reference models. We have three talks today and uh, we will start. Uh, oh. Okay, we will uh, start first with Amin talks and he will give us how, our view, how his view or he will report on um, the results of an evaluation regarding the usefulness of uh, two modeling notations. And then depending if uh, Monique is there, then we will continue with her talk or otherwise we will hear how to apply the subject-oriented modeling in a virtual factory context. Um, therefore, I would suggest, I mean, the Zoom is now yours and um, I'm happy to have you here and please start with the presentation. Thanks, Agnes, and uh, thank you everyone for attending this session. My name is Amin Jalali and I'm a senior lecturer at the Stockholm University. And this paper is about evaluating perceived usefulness and ease of use of CMMN and DCR. So this way, in this paper, we are going to speak about process modeling languages and as like any other languages, they are means to support communication on understanding and many more. Business process languages in particular help us to understand business processes, again, uh, communicate with others and analyze it and uh, do implementation, configuration, enactment and monitoring and much more to improve processes. When we see different sort of processes uh, outside, we see we can two different spectrum based on level of flexibility. On one hand, we have these traditional workflow based processes, uh, which we can see in manufacturers. And on the other hand, we can see these knowledge intensive processes that we can see, for example, in healthcare domain. So these um, a workflow based processes, which we can see in manufacturing, for example, has very rich tradition and come back uh, a long time ago, for example, when Henry Ford started to uh, do a revolution in uh, industrial revo revolution by uh, doing a workflow based uh, process uh, optimization. So the main idea is to have normal flow of process with, uh, with the help uh, by removing deviation and exceptions and uh, increasing efficiency, we can gain more from processes. But on the other hand, we have this knowledge intensive process. For example, when we go to a hospital, we can see each different case are different. We cannot treat all patients the same. So the, each case needs different sort of treatment and how we treat people depends on the knowledge worker. In this case, for example, a doctor. And uh, that requires different level of support. And if we consider a level of support, we can see workflow modeling languages are very good languages to support workflow based processes. And hopefully many of us are familiar with this like Petronets, YOL, BPMN, and many other more modeling languages. But on the other hand, we have these knowledge intensive processes. And as we can see, workflow modeling languages are not very good to provide support for those kind of modeling language, for, for those uh, business processes. Uh, the other sort of process modeling languages are case management modeling languages. And here we can see examples like Declare, DCR, and CMMN. And uh, these are different languages that can support these knowledge intensive processes. And they are more uh, into defining constraints and uh, defining what is uh, not allowed and the rest is uh, possible. So these languages will be die if no users accept it and use it in practice. It's like similar extinct human languages that uh, nowadays uh, are not used anymore. So it's important when a new language is designed, we uh, evaluate how users perceives that so we can optimize them and we can do, uh, we can learn by the mistakes and we can uh, up, uh, improve them. So one way to see if the, if the languages are usable or not is to evaluate perceived usefulness and ease of use, which is the topic of this paper. 
So uh, what is the problem? Case management modeling languages are still new. And although some studies have investigated how the process designer perceive DECLARE and DCR, there is a lack of research on how they perceive CMMN. And CMMN would be interesting because it's uh, a standard uh, published by OMG, which is the same organization that published BPMN and DMN specification. So it's important to see how users perceive this language uh, as well. And therefore, we define the search question as how do trained process designers perceive the usefulness and ease of use of DCR and CMMN languages for modeling knowledge intensive processes. We include DCR also to have a base later if you want to compare. And there are several challenges when we want to do this evaluation. The first one is that uh, this is, these are new languages. So it's hard, if not impossible, to find users who already know them and apply it in practice. So we need to train users regardless who they are to learn these languages because uh, it's, uh, it might be very few, if not any, uh, in the real world. So also the other challenge is measuring the acceptance. So uh, the acceptance shall be measured based on users' perceptions, which is a sort of self-assessment. And here, there might be several biased factors involved. So if I refer to Dunning-Kruger effect, we can see if one start learning a new concept when they don't know anything, when they start learning uh, because they are blind to what is unknown for them, they could come to very high confident level that they know everything. So, and we might see that to, to a students that they start learning the new concepts and they probably don't know what they don't know and they think that, oh, I know a lot. And then when they hopefully continue to learn more, they see what they don't know. And then that level of confidence will be vanished. So this is, if we ask, if we introduce, for example, a new language to a person and ask uh, for uh, uh, reflection on perceived uh, usefulness and ease of use, we may suffer from overconfidence if they haven't practiced enough. But if they continue to learn, then uh, they come to another issue that uh, th that extra confidence will disappear. Some of them may come to underconfidence because they think they don't know anything and they come to this valley of despair. And then as they continue learning, the confidence about how they uh, know about the subjects increase little by little and they come to a stable uh, level of confidence at the end. And it's, it's uh, funny that uh, I was looking at one video that with one professor and some very new students participated and they showed the same level of confidence. And that's interesting to see how the confidence is built and change over time. So the bias factor here is over or under confidence. And these are important to be considered in this sort of evaluation when we uh, evaluate new languages. So this bias factor can be minimized by repeating experience and feedback. If users uh, try to continue learning and uh, uh, get feedback on the assignment, for example, or other tasks that they uh, reach to the end of the, this curve. So based on this introduction, I can say how we set up our study and define the method. So uh, to uh, evaluate uh, the uh, perceived usefulness and ease of use, we use technology acceptance model, which is, which is a model which is widely used in information system to do the, the, the same sort of evaluation. Uh, and participants in this study was students in the master program in open e-government. This is a special program. This is a distance program, which means that uh, we don't have lectures like uh, other courses. So a student receive, receives materials to study uh, and they have Q&A uh, to go through uh, the, to, uh, in which we answer the questions and they do assignments. So uh, for, uh, in this course, they had uh, two slots for one DCR, one CMMN, and uh, the materials in DCR was uh, uh, given to them from the DCR company and uh, uh, the founder of DCR was helping us to want the 
uh, Q&A sessions, which, we, which was two Q&A sessions. Uh, the CMMN, uh, in CMMN module, they received the uh, a specification of CMMN plus some additional uh, materials uh, that I developed. And also the Q&A for CMMN was run by myself. And uh, they do uh, their assignments, uh, which was uh, cases from their experience in industry and uh, other places that they found. And they uh, uh, received comments based on that uh, through the course that they improve their knowledge. So as their background, they knew BPMN, but they didn't declare any prior experience or knowledge about case management modeling languages. And in average, uh, they, uh, they were around 34 years old, and this is quite high, and this is because uh, probably most of them are working at the same time as taking courses at this distance program. Uh, so uh, the, the, study, the process for the order study start after the exam. So before the exam, we, they, uh, we try to teach and uh, go through that learning curve and they participated in the exam. The participation was optional and uh, they knew that they should do two tasks, but they didn't know what tasks they will do. So after the exam, we sent the first survey based on technology acceptance model that they should feel and reflect about how they perceived uh, these two languages uh, as easy to use and useful. And they had a deadline to respond to that. If they uh, we collected a, a response, we uh, keep it. Otherwise, the survey will be closed automatically. After that, we published the exam result and comments. And they had time to go through the comments. And if they had questions, they could come and ask. And we waited for five days. And the reason for waiting was that we wanted them to grasp the comments and go through all of that before filling the second survey. And they didn't know that the second task is the same survey actually. So then we come to the ne next phase and we sent the uh, same survey to those who participated in the first study. And again, they, it was option also. Some of them uh, didn't respond, and, uh, but majority of them did respond. So after that, we analyzed data from survey one, and then we joined these two uh, 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 responses and uh, analyzed how they changed from survey one to survey two. And we can take a look at the result in general here. As we can see, 20 students participated in the first survey, and this is how they perceived uh, usefulness and ease of use of these two languages. And uh, as you see, uh, the, uh, the survey answer could be uh, from uh, a strong, a strongly disagree to a strongly agree, and it was seven uh, scale survey. So uh, it means that 3.5 is the medium, is the uh, uh, average. Uh, but uh, if you look at the responses, we can see the average uh, is around uh, five. The median is around five, sorry. And uh, it looks quite good. But if we look at the students who participated in both surveys, those 13 students out of these 20 who replied to both surveys, we can see how the response is changed from uh, uh, before receiving the feedback to after receiving the feedback. And uh, we showed uh, the result for these 13 uh, students for the first survey with dashed green. So uh, you, as you see, perceived ease of use is almost the same, maybe a little change, but perceived usefulness is different because the number of students from which we compile these results is different. This is based on 20 students, this is based on 13 students. But after feedback is quite, uh, it's uh, some noticeable change here. And uh, if you want to see the confidence interval, uh, it's uh, quite good shape because uh, even with the 95% confidence interval, we can say most of them is above 3.5, but a little of this uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, DCR and CMMN uh, after receiving feedback fall into that uh, line. So the question is, is this, change from the first uh, response to second response, uh, is there any signif significant difference in between? So it's hard to tell by looking at them. Then we did some uh, a statistical test to 
to test if these are significant difference or not. And the null hypothesis here is that the distribution of responses before and after the feedback are the same for both perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. And here the result, uh, as uh, we can see, so the, we plotted the result here and uh, to test if they are significant or not, we did some significant tests. And we couldn't use t-test because the distribution of uh, the distribution was not normal distribution. So we used three non-parametric statistical significant tests. And uh, these three was Man, uh, Whitney Yu, uh, Wilcoxon, and Moots Median. And in all of these three, the p-value was greater than 5%. Therefore, we cannot reject the null hypothesis, thus the feedback did not change the perception significantly. And uh, this shows that uh, they reached quite a stable, uh, this can indicate that this, they reached quite a stable opinion uh, at this point by receiving feedback. Uh, but if this result is reliable or not, uh, this is the detailed uh, level of perceptions for CMMN and uh, DCR. And uh, in each of these um, measures, we have several questions and they try to measure the same thing. For example, if how they perceive CMMN uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of perceived usefulness or CMMN in terms of perceived ease of use. And uh, as those sub-questions can correlate, uh, we can use uh, Coron Job Alpha to see if the responses are correlate well and are they valid? Uh, are they valid? So in current jobs alpha, if the value is above 70% uh, is acceptable. And uh, this is uh, the test that is widely used in combination with technology acceptance model in different literature, and uh, it's used for uh, reliability testing. And uh, as we can see uh, for the uh, first study, the uh, DCR uh, received very co uh, quite high uh, of alpha value and CMM is also the same for perceived usefulness, but for perceived ease of use, it's acceptable. It's not that high as those others. But if we see the uh, second study, which is after uh, the result before and after receiving feedback, we can see it's quite high. But this is interesting that the feedback uh, increased the reliability of responses quite significantly, as we can see from accepted level to very high measure here. So that was also interesting point to, uh, from this study that we reached. Uh, was there any threats to validity? We can say we used the students as our test subjects. So uh, as any subjects that could be used in this study needs training as uh, these are new languages, uh, this could minimize these uh, threats, I can say. And uh, however, this can weaken the causal relation for predicting if the artifact will be used in future, because it's not evaluated based on real experience of people who use that in practice. And that's it, that is common in evaluation for different uh, languages that I saw in literature. And also uh, I should mention that the students were familiar with BPMN. Uh, the impact is unknown. I don't know if that impacts the result or not. So this is also interesting future work that to be investigated if uh, prior knowledge of BPMN could have positive or negative impact on how people could perceive uh, these sort of languages. So that would be interesting a study if someone also can perform that. And uh, also the other threats is feedback. So positive or negative feedback can be uh, considered positive or negative treatment. Uh, to minimize this threat, we try to use a neutral wording to minimize uh, this effect as much as we could. So uh, we tried, for example, not to uh, call a students in the comments, rather refer to the work and different practice that exists in that uh, wording. Uh, this is uh, the sample uh, models that could be generated for the case that we had. This uh, might look simple, but uh, it varies based on uh, different students because they model differently. Some came up with uh, very complex models, for example, but some could manage to do it very neat and tidy. And it also depends, for example, in DCR if they use hierarchies or not, 
and also how they design different uh, elements in CMMN. For example, if they design a stage or not, or if they uh, 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 interconnect uh, different elements with different rules or not. So this was open for them to decide and model. So with that uh, examples, I reached my end of presentation and uh, thank you for listening and uh, I will be happy to come to question and answer and discussion. Many thanks, I mean, very nice, very interesting talk. Um, so I would like to start uh, with a discussion. I can remember some years ago, I already reviewed some papers on the usability of Declare or other uh, declarative oriented modeling languages. Um, I really, I can't remember how the values were uh, for uh, perceived usefulness or ease of use. Uh, have you compared your results with these uh, related works just to have, uh, let's say a benchmark, uh, how good is your, uh, uh, your result? Uh, yeah, I think in related work I discussed uh, with different works that I could find um, because this is, uh, I evaluated based on DCR and uh, CMMN. I could find one articles that is based on C, uh, DCR and uh, Declare, which uh, published some years ago. Uh, by looking into numbers, it seems similar in terms of uh, uh, usability, but uh, it's, it can, I don't know if it's possible to do very rigorous comparison because they are in different settings and they are uh, with different scales. So that was a little hard to do uh, based on that perspective. But uh, from just, um, my first impression was that it was close, but that was very subjective. <laughs> and and one th on one slide, you summarize all your results before feedback and after feedback. Maybe you could go to this slide. Do not have any numbers. Um, that was uh, the it, Have you any yeah. explanation why, for instance, um, the perceived uh, usefulness didn't change after feedback, while perceived ease of use has some implications, the feedback loop? Do we have any explanation for that? Uh, for me, was this one was interesting because, uh, as you said, for example, for the change for CMMN was not that much, but this change, for example, for DCR seems very different. But when and uh, but when I did the uh, significant test, uh, the result was that it's not that much significant. So, uh, from a statistical point of view. Uh, it can be random, uh, but uh, uh, that can be different results. One impression can, can be due to still comments that, for example, they uh, see still some problems that they tout uh, they design correctly, but when they receive the comments at the exam and they realize that, oh, uh, I designed it incorrectly, so I understood it incorrectly, maybe they uh, didn't grasp it as simple as they uh, tout before receiving the feedback. This is my uh, uh, my thought about that, but uh, the significant test didn't confirm that this is a significant difference between them. But you haven't asked the students maybe about, or uh, did, uh, did they have any possibility to comment something or that? Uh, I collect, uh, yeah, I, I collected comments, but I haven't yet uh, analyze them because it was many comments from students. So uh, in future, I uh, also will analyze the comment. Also in this paper, I didn't compare CMMN and DCR because it was lack of space. But uh, one future analysis that I can do is that to compare if the uh, difference between CMMN and DCR for the same measure are significantly different or not, or are they considered the same? Okay, I see Tina, she has a question. Um, yeah. La Laura, yeah. I don't know. I can know you hear me? we can hear you. Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, thanks for the presentation. I mean, it was very interesting. Uh, I wonder Thank what's you. the bottom line. I mean, can we expect uh, good acceptance of these uh, languages? 
And when you say uh, perceived usefulness, uh, then I wonder in what context, because my students, when they learn another uh, modeling uh, a language, they ask, what do we need it for? And here it, of course, should uh, or can be used for uh, processes which cannot be captured using uh, languages like BPMN. So I wonder whether this context was uh, um, clear to the students. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thanks for the question, Pinina. Uh, the context in this exam was the educational context that they received one case from university, uh, which I put the context in the paper as well, the text that they received. Uh, but this is quite, uh, that, uh, that can be a quite uh, valid point. So maybe it's worse to repeat the experience in different contexts and see how that may change the student's opinion about that. But as all of these are subjective, of course, one uh, parameter is the context itself that can change the perception. I agree with that. Any Thanks. other questions from the audience? Maybe I can also ask an additional question. So on one slide, you showed the curve with the what do you call Dunning Kruger effect, and um, as far as I understood, the the feedback loop was one way of, let's say, reducing uh, or considering this effect. Are there any additional features that you can use within a questionnaire in order to let's say, to, to reduce, avoid some of the effects? Uh, yeah, maybe good to explain it more. Uh, so uh, we did the study starting after the exam. So before the exam, they had almost, uh, the course was running for more than two months. So from the study, uh, from the start of the study, they practice a lot. So from my personal belief is that they pass this curve significantly because they learned and they receive feedback and they do assi did assignment on that. So just, I wanted to show here that if uh, we only start by showing a new languages to people without enough practice, and then we ask about opinion, we might come to this overconfidence bias because they learned just uh, and didn't practice enough. But in this uh, experience, because they experienced a lot, they did assignment on these languages and uh, or, uh, and the course was running for two months. I think we reached to the, uh, we passed these uh, curves uh, to some degree and uh, we see that the, the significant uh, was not dif um, uh, differ much. Okay, then again, thank you very much for an interesting talk. And then thank you we'll come much. to this second speaker. Um, so Monique, will you manage to give your talk now? I can't hear you. I see your presentation now. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, good. I have to switch it on and off. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> Welcome everyone. So um, I will be presenting a paper on supporting data aware processes with uh, Meroda. Um, so the situation we start from is a situation where as researchers we all uh, like to focus on a particular domain of expertise and so what we see happening is that uh, we have like uh, a kind of silos where you have people uh, that are like very well um, uh, have a lot of expertise in process modeling, people who have a lot of expertise in data modeling, people who have a lot of uh, expertise in user interface modeling and so on. But we see that the connections between the different domains are not always uh, optimal. And for people in practice, uh, this means that when they have to combine different models with each other, they are facing certain gaps because they, yeah, the, the expertise on how to combine everything is not always uh, very clear and very present. 
So um, I looked into uh, data aware process modeling and the research that has been performed in that area. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, paper from the, the group of uh, Manfred Reichert, um, which actually does already a, a very good literature review of everything that has happened in that area and, and that tries to bridge, uh, that starts from the process world and tries to bridge into the data world. I also looked into uh, papers from the data world bridging to process world, but that is kind of inexistent. So the best starting point would be, would be this paper. Um, if you look at, at all the approaches that are listed here, you will see that um, the, the approach of uh, the, the um, artifact-centric approach is clearly the approach that has the, the most proposals. Um, nevertheless, if you look at how these different approaches address the data aspect, you see that there's a lot of variety. So there are approaches that speak about data objects. Some people start talk about business artifacts. Some approaches are focused on case files, some on objects, some on tuples. But rarely these approaches start from a full-fledged uh, data modeling approach. So, and for me, a full-fledged domain modeling approach would be that you define the business objects or business artifacts, whatever you want to call them, and their associations, and that you have an enterprise-wide definition of those business concepts that are shared by all the business processes. So you, you do not make a data model specific for one or two business processes, but you really have an a, a encompassing wide data model and you graft your business processes on, on that enterprise-wide data model. And so far as I understand it from the literature review and from the papers that I have seen, this doesn't exist yet. I also ran the query again because the, the Dalek paper goes up till I think 2018. So I, I ran the query again to see if I could find new approaches, but it, but it seems nothing is already, um, there's no proposal that has already a full-fledged domain modeling approach combined with process modeling. So as a result, I conclude that a global perspective on combining full-fledged process modeling with full-fledged domain uh, modeling does not exist yet. There's also no integrated uh, meta model, so it's not a meta model of say UML class diagrams with BPMN meta model or something like that doesn't seem to exist really. And also as a result, there is no practical approach from modelers on how to tackle uh, combining these two types of modeling with each other. So that was a starting point for our research. And so we wanted to investigate a data aware process modeling approach but assuming the existence or the joint development of an enterprise-wide domain model and really as a full-fledged conceptual modeling exercise. So not just the data needed for a process, but really a full-fledged uh, conceptual domain modeling exercise. And this would be part of a larger goal of multi-modeling where we would in the end also try to combine this with uh, user interface modeling, uh, maybe uh, other aspects like authorizations and so on. Um, the multi-modeling approach is not new. It's an idea that has been around for quite a while and um, it, it relies on also IEEE standards on, on architecture that say that for any system you need to address multiple concerns and each concern is addressed by a certain viewpoint for which you would develop a model and all these models need to be integrated and need to be consistent with each other. If you look at proposals that exist and, and that to a certain extent already address multiple viewpoints, then these are the, the general viewpoints that you will find. There's mostly always a data viewpoint or a business object viewpoint. And in a layered approach of software development, this would be the base layer that is at the kernel of your system. There is very often also a business object behavior uh, viewpoint where you identify the states a business object can be in, like an order can be paid or shipped, a product can be available or un unavailable, a customer can be blacklisted or not blacklisted and so on. Um, that's business logic and is usually put on top of the data layer. Then there is a shared service 
perspective. So this is a, a set of services that you offer to access or modify the information that is stored in your persistence layer. And that would be typically the third layer. So the, the viewpoint that you put on top of your business logic because the shared services have to respect the business logic. And then uh, you also have a business process layer um, which tackles the business process behavior viewpoint and you also have a business actor viewpoint. So this would make more or less four layers that you will find in many proposals for a layered approach and a multi viewpoint approach. If you look at the current um, proposals for data aware processes, you will find some of these layers, um, sometimes four out of five, sometimes three out of five, rarely you can find all uh, viewpoints, all five viewpoints uh, addressed uh, simultaneously. Um, so what we have done is uh, based on the expertise that we have in our own research group, we, we did a kind of a proof of concept to see if we can combine the approaches that we know into a full fledged approach that combines everything. And so in particular for the main modeling, we start from the uh, Merode approach, which is UML based which is actually a very much an artifact centric approach because it identifies business artifacts in their life cycles and then has services on top of that. Uh, it's also been formalized with process algebra. So that's a nice add on because if you want to verify it again, business processes, you already have a process perspective inside the road and it allows for fast prototyping. So you can like immediately check out some things, whether it would work as software or not. And then to, it doesn't really have an elaborate approach for process modeling. So for that, we looked into BPMN and to have it a proof of concept software wise, we uh, based our proof of concept on the Camunda platform. Uh, Merode itself identifies three layers, an enterprise layer, an information system service layer, and a business process layer. The enterprise layer is the bottom layer, and it actually addresses three view viewpoints. So it addresses the data viewpoint through a UML class diagram. It addresses the second viewpoint of business process, uh, business object behavior by using state charts, also uh, from UML compliant technique. And then it identifies atomic services, you could say, shared services by identifying business events um, and uses that to capture the interaction between different business objects. The second layer is an information system service layer. It's not that well elaborated in Merode. It's just mentioned that you can have input and output services. The input services will trigger the changes. So we'll request changes to information by triggering the business events and the output service can just query the state of business objects. So this kind of also addresses viewpoint three, but then with more coarse grained services. In, compar in comparison to the very fine granular uh, business event services. And then the top layer is the business process layer, which Merode just mentions that you can put it on top of it, but without elaborating it much further. And um, so it, is, it needs to capture the business processes and should address viewpoints four and five. So the processes and the actors. To work out the proof of concept, we used a running example from the Philharmonics paper, um, where the same example is elaborated uh, uh, with the Philharmonics framework. And so that's an example on uh, job applications. So you have a job for which you can have several applications. And for each candidate, you will have a number of reviews of the application and an interview. Um, and then you define according to the artifact centric approach that Merode follows, you have a state chart for a job, the job can exist or it can be filled, the candidate has been hired. You will have a state chart for the application where the application can exist, uh, be submitted, the, it can be deemed eligible for hiring or not, and then you can have the hired or the non-hired candidates. Um, and then you also have a state machine for the review that can be initiated where it's still under construction and it can be submitted. And then Meroda has this uh, object event table that identifies the business events, one in each row. 
and each business event indicates which are the objects that will be affected by the state machine. So for example, you see here, if you decide to hire a certain person, it will change the status of the application because the application will be, go to the status, this is the candidate you want to hire, and also the job will change, uh, change status because the job will be filled from that moment. Uh, and then the idea is that you put on top of this model, which already contains some process aspects, you put um, a business process layer. And this would be an example of a BPMN diagram of the, the business process for collecting reviews, where you would have a task write review. And this task would then correspond to uh, using or triggering certain elements in the life cycle of the review. So like creating your review, uh, updating it a few times and ending your task by submitting the review. So to look at the, how the connection could work exactly between those two layers, we will look at um, a process constituting of two tasks. The first is reviewing an application and the other one is recording the decision. And I will first walk you through the manual execution. So without using a process engine and how do, this would work. And then I will explain how you could do this by adding a process engine on top of the generated application. So suppose you, you do not use a process engine. So in Meroda, you would use the models on the previous slide to generate an application and you would obtain a prototype application. Of course, you could make a real one, but we will use the prototype application. And it simply has like one tab per business object and uh, you can just uh, trigger the events for these different business objects by clicking on these buttons. So for example, if you have your task is review the application, you can go to the application tab and then you can click on the view details and then you simply get a window that shows you the details of this one particular application of uh, Charlotte. It's Charlotte that applies as a PhD student for a job on multi-modeling. Um, and then if you want to have more details, you can see, okay, there are reviews in for this application. Jochen has made written a review for Charlotte's application. So you can still say, okay, I want to view the details of that one. And then you, you can see that he says, okay, you should hire her because she's really good. Okay, so that would be uh, purely a task where you only um, extract the data and just look at what data is in the system. The other task, record decision, is one where you want to uh, make a change to an object in the system. So in this case, you, you still take Charlotte's application. She is in the state eligible and you decide to hire her. So you click on the site to hire. Um, and what happens then is that you will trigger here. So you have the application window. You will trigger the business event service decide to hire. And you can see this in the prototype application that it then checks the states of the different objects that are involved. So it checks whether the application is in the right state, checks whether the job is in the right state. And then if everything is fine, it will execute it. So once it has executed it, you see that Charlotte states change changes to candidate to hire and the job also changes state into candidate hired. So now it is filled. So the event service performs the necessary changes onto the business objects. So now if you want to do this, but then with a process engine, what you need actually is that instead of using this Java interface to the application, you want a business process engine to interface to that application. And uh, it is possible to generate a REST interface that wraps this event handling layer and the enterprise layer that is generated by default in a Meroda application. And so what happens now is that when you review the application, you can create a form and this form will, by means of get requests, um, extract the data from the review object and the application object and give that data, show that data to the user. And if you perform the record decision task, you can have a form and that form uh, will now use a post request to post the event decide to hire to the system 
which will perform the same checks and then reply with either, okay, I could perform this event or no, uh, there was no success, uh, something went wrong, this is the error message. So actually what you do is you just replace the Java interface by a REST interface and you can use that then to interface the Camunda engine to this, um, to this generated application. And this allows you to prototype your business process using a real application. Um, this actually is a way of implementing the, the Meroda meta model, which already identifies how to connect a Meroda application to a process layer. So if you look into the Meroda meta model, you will see that there is already some objects defined for the domain layer, the enterprise layer in blue. There are some uh, meta objects defined for the information system service layer, and there are some just some very basic elements of what could be a connection to a business process layer. That's what is shown here in the green box. And so what we have actually done is define two tasks, which are elements of the business process meta model. Uh, there are the forms that are our inputs and output services, and there is the object inspection and event triggering, which are the requests, the post and get requests. And so actually we're implementing in this way, different elements of the meta model that bridge the domain, the business process meta model to the Meroda meta model. Of course, remains to be evaluated if what we have done uh, makes sense and satisfies the num a number of properties that have been put forward uh, in the Philharmonics framework, which is like uh, quite a good list of properties that a, a data aware uh, process system should have. Um, there are properties related to data. And what is interesting there is that in the Philharmonics paper, um, they explicitly refer to a hierarchy uh, between objects uh, where they say that uh, the job is uh, at the highest point in the hierarchy and the application is subordinate to the job and then the review subordinate to the application. And if you look into the Miro, the modeling tool, you can see that we already have because the Meroda model is by nature also hierarchic and you have there a tool that allows you to ask for the top down levels or the bottom up levels if you prefer of your class diagram and so the Meroda will already uh, identify all this this hierarchy by nature in a data model so this kind of complies already to the basic id that is already present in the present in the philharmonics framework um, Philharmonics framework also puts a number of properties forward related to activities. Um, most of these can be supported, but not always per default by the prototype. So some are, but not all of them. There are properties related to processes. These are well supported, especially object behavior and object interaction are by nature uh, supported by what is already present in the Meroda method. And then if we combine it with uh, the business process layer, we also get these uh, like coarse grained uh, uh, layers, uh, levels via the information system layer and the business process layer. So the combination allows to address like different levels of granularity. Um, the properties related to the users, there we really have to rely on a process engine like Camunda. So that is really where we need to enrich the Meroda approach with a full-fledged business process modeling approach because that's by nature not uh, supported by Meroda only. So you can see that um, the data and the activities are supported by Meroda, but then if you want to have like properties related to processes and to users, you really need to have the, the, the process part of it. So you really need to do the two to, to cover everything. Monitoring is something that is uh, jointly, I mean, monitoring of the data is, is uh, supported by the possibility to view data. Uh, so inside an application, you have a database, there's an interface to the database. So this allows you to query all the data. And of course, process monitoring can be done by means of the interface of Camunda. There's a, many more detailed criteria. Uh, I will not go over all of them in detail, but you can see here in color, the ones that are not supported fully. Um, and so you see that there are a number of criteria related to uh, authorizations, the access to the data, vertical authorizations, and, and specific number of user integration uh, criteria. 
um, with the prototype that we made, which is like the out of the box implementation of the generated application and the process layer, we cannot yet support those. There is, however, nothing that prevents us to write additional code and then it should be possible to support it. So there's no like, um, some, nothing that hinders us to, to really have a full-fledged approach, but it's not out of the box. And the same for the different forms of flexibility with variable granularity, flexible process execution and explicit uh, user decisions. Those are not supported by what we have proposed right now. Um, but it should be possible to extend the approach to also support these aspects. All the others that are in black are actually supported by the out of the box approach. So in conclusion, um, what we can see is that if you start with a domain modeling approach, like the Meroda approach, and especially if you start with an artifact centric approach, um, this domain model by means of mandatory associations and state charts already uh, contains quite a number of constraints that will impact what are possible business processes. So when you do conceptual modeling, you should be aware of the processes you would like to support in the future when you will build your process layer. And reversely, I think that when you do process modeling, you should be aware of the fact that underneath there is a data model that also obeys a number of rules. So I think this combined development of both uh, the domain model and the process modeling is really interesting because it allows you to iterate between the two and really have a, a good consistency between the two. Um, the main limitation of our research for now is the out of the box implementation. We just use it a generated prototype which doesn't really allow for any customization and we did a very basic linking of Kamunda to the existing application. Um, I think more is possible but it would require uh, quite some effort, programming effort, making more elaborate modeling diagrams, generation and so on. But nevertheless this basic proof of concept already satisfies quite a number of the requirements so that's really promising. Also, if you look into the research, you see that the usability of data-centric approaches is a source of concern because it's like quite complex. Um, but on the other hand, our research also demonstrates, uh, the research was just presented at MSAT, that UML class diagrams and UML state charts are amongst the most used modeling languages. Um, so if you would combine those two modeling favorites with uh, BPMN, this could meet usability concerns because you're really using what people are familiar with. So that could be a winning combination. Um, my utopian, I don't know if it's a utopian goal, but uh, it would require quite some uh, funding to find the necessary PG students and developers, is to achieve full-fledged code generation from a combined uh, BPMN, a set of BPMN models and a domain model and so that you could um, do process validation through the integrated prototyping of a collection of processes and the supporting information system. Ideally, you also add user interface models to that. Um, and then you would really have uh, a very powerful uh, system uh, environment where you can very easily prototype applications to see if you have, uh, you're making something that is worthwhile for your customer or user. Um, so in conclusion, I think this was for us a convincing proof of concept and uh, we plan to continue the research on this uh, by working out a meta model a bit further by maybe also looking into combinations with DMN and CMMN, especially for flexibility and the user decisions that could be interesting extensions. Um, another path or avenue would be dealing with authorizations, um, enhancing the code generation and do some usability evaluation. And this concludes my presentation. So I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. Of course, there are questions. <laughs> Thanks for, for your talk. Um, so I will start again the discussion. In the meanwhile, the audience can think about questions. Um, so when when um, 
partners or project partners ask me, can we analyze the data? Then I always ask, okay, what kind of data do you have? What are they, what is the use case? And I was thinking about, are there any use cases where would you say, no, the Maroda approach cannot be applied in, in this context? Um, I think the Maroda approach is um, what I call, it's, it's enterprise information systems engineering. So it's really meant for um, that type of system. I think if you would like to develop software for your mobile phone, I would not advise you to use the Maroda approach. No, but, I was rather thinking in inter-organizational context or distributed processes. I was rather thinking in this. Yeah. In this um, I think... Um, in inter-organizational inter systems, um, we do have some experience with combining different software packages. And so my advice to students then is always, or to, to practitioners who want to apply it, is um, if you want to use the approach to um, reconcile different universes of this course, what is important is that you focus on the shared data. So what is the data that you need to share and that you need to agree on? And ideally, you have a common model for that one. Um, and then you could capture that data and then base your inter-organizational processes on that data in the idea that you both have the same data. If you have different data and that you really need data conversions so that you have like really two different separate worlds and that your uh, process is about communicating between two organizations, but not really um, basing on, well, the data of the individual organizations, but no common data, then I think this would be a use case where I don't see like an immediate application for it. I would need to think that through a little bit and maybe we can find a bit of a workaround, but I think for now that it would work best if you have business processes that work on a common data model at least. It doesn't have to mean that all the data is stored on the same location. It can still be that you decide to distribute your database, but at least the data model is shared between the different actors and that are using your business processes. Okay. There is a question in the audience. Giovanni. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. So, thank you very much for your uh, very presentation. For your presentation, it was very interesting. However, I do have a question about uh, the role of processes and data, and then uh, intermeaning. I mean, if I correctly understood, at level two of your framework, you can basically model the life cycle of the data objects uh, via a UML state chart. Whereas yes. at level five, you can also model how the process should manage the data. Yeah. However, typically when you create a process model and that process model interacts with data, you do create some sort of implicit life cycle of the data, of the data object that the process manipulates. So it could happen that there may be a conflicting um, there may be some conflicts within the explicit uh, life cycle of the data modeled in the state machine and yeah. uh, the, the, one, the implicit one modeled in the process model. I was just curious to know if you have taken that into consideration and maybe if you are, have or are going to implement some kind of conflict detection mechanisms to reconcile those two perspectives. Yeah, yes. So the way I, I see it is that um, if you make a Maroda model, and I said it's already formalized with process algebra, so based on those state charts and using um, communi yeah, communicating sequential processes, the process algebra by Tony Hoare, um, you can actually define all the possible scenarios that are supported by a Maroda meta model. So it is possible. So you could say, I take all these state machines together. There's a parallel operator that defines when you combine those state machines, what is the resulting language? So I, I'm really thinking in terms of a language as a collection of scenarios that are supported. This defines the playgrounds. A business process will only be allowed to execute a scenario that is captured, that is inside this playground. 
if, for example, you make a state machine, um, like uh, more easily to think is like you have an, an, an object order and you say that your order has to be paid before it can be shipped, you put that in your state machine. If then later on you have a business process that tries to ship an order before it has been paid, the computer will say no, it's impossible. So that's really a point of concern because it needs you have to check the consistency. Actually, we had already a PhD about that years ago. It's the PhD of Manu de Bakker. And he actually, the topic of his PhD was to verify this consistency. So he worked both on consistency of business processes amongst themselves, but also the, the consistency of a business process with a Moreau de Meta model. So he investigated that. It's not that easy because, um, yeah, you have problems of interleaving, unbounded interleaving and so on. So you quickly run into very, uh, yeah, things that are, that you cannot really calculate. So you really have to look then like, are we going to use this type of petri nets or that type of petri nets? So it's not that easy to address, but actually it has already been investigated quite a while ago. Okay, so we are running okay. out of time. So I would like to hand over to the third speaker. Monique, thanks again for your talk. You're welcome. Mathis. Are you there? Very Can you much. share your screen? Yes, now that Monique has uh, given me the opportunity, let me share right. my screen with you. So I hope you can hear me and that you can see my emails. That should not happen. No, um, yeah. <laughs> Just go I ahead to start your, your problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, dear audience. My name is Mathis Elstermann, and I have the honor to present to you our uh, introduction of a subject-oriented reference process model for virtual factory operations commissioning that uh, was a collaboration between me, uh, Ms. Stephanie Beetz from Furtwang University, Mr. Matthias Lederer from Ostbayerische Technische Hochschule am Bergweiden, Mr. Werner Schmidt from the TH Ingolstadt, and last but not least, uh, Ms. Führer from the same institute as I am from the KIT and all in Germany. And uh, while I introduce to that, I would kindly ask Laura to start a little poll that will be of relevance later on, and maybe you can answer it next to it, while um, I am uh, introducing you to this model. And as the title states, this has something to do with factory operations commissioning. So a very technical discipline that is all about, well, going to some place where a new factory is to be organized, to be run, uh, set up, ramped up, so to speak, in order to finally give the facility operator some certificate of performance. However, um, in between when setting this up for the first time on location, there may be some error reports that may require design changes. Um, but hopefully, of course, everyone hopes that we get reports of successful ramp up to some people. Yet the problem is, of course, that especially nowadays, originally this was, is nothing new. This happens basically, um, has happened basically for the last 150 years, ever since we have had factories. However, nowadays it has become even more complicated due to, as you're all aware of, the advance of digitalization with mechatronic products being more and more relevant. So nowadays it's not only design changes and mechanical aspects, but rather also a huge aspect is programming of controlled software. And so this whole ramper process may be hindered if, for example, some software errors can be found in between and need to be costly fixed. And this is especially terrible if this happens, of course, in uh, during ramp up on site, uh, which leads in general to some figures that this whole initial ramp up that the team here is doing may factor up to 25% of an initial or complete factory planning project. And this, of course, is very cost extensive. And especially if some problems have to be fixed while the team is on site, while everything is there, while the customer is already waiting or so, this updates um, are very costly, can lead to long downtimes and delays, etc. And of course, in this context, it would be useful to use modern digital engineering methods to improve that. And that is the idea of, of course, 
a virtual factory operations commissioning. And the idea is basically to have a complete virtual real-time computer simulation model running in parallel to the development uh, that allows to do iterative development. Naturally, such models, such especially usable models, do not come out of thin air, but rather require some experts that are able to really uh, in, uh, build up such a model, operate it, run it, which is here indicated by the Virtual Factory Operations Commissioning team. So we need people to do that, but hopefully if they are correct, and then it should allow uh, more people that are involved, for example, in mechanical or electrical design aspects to test their designs in a virtual environment, but also equally allows programmers to test, virtually test their controlled software in order to, in, in an iterative loop approach, but in, so to speak, real life settings. And therefore, we hopefully catch errors more easily earlier and so this whole testing happens virtually. So in the end, we deliver software that is um, less error prone. So we have, uh, and this is mostly due to there being here a kind of parallel um, development of all of this in an interdisciplinary approach, obviously, since we have mechanical and electrical and pneumatic designs, and of course, in the programming aspects, ideally to avoid and minimize time. Now, of course, um, this does not happen automatically in order to build such a model up. We need extensive uh, previous knowledge or some, maybe some ideas about the digital models here, design solutions, or, but also requirements. So it does not come out of thin air. And uh, partial of the, partially, this is already done. So maybe you've heard about concepts like hardware in the loop. However, hardware in the loop is only specific operations and op idea of virtual factory operations commissioning is more like that you have basically a whole software system that are needed to complete this whole factory um, and allow this running in a kind of iterative loop situation. However, as you can see up here, this looks obviously familiar to the previous di diagram we've shown you. Um, virtual factory commissioning is, of course, no replacement for real commissioning. Some At some point, someone has to go to the real location and build up a factory, and errors might be found there as well. So um, virtual factory commissioning is not a replacement, but it comes before the actual activities on site and hopefully uh, improves that. Now, after the introduction to the domain, what was our research motivation? What was our goal of our research? Well. Um, we wanted to have a model that allows better understanding of virtual factory operations commissioning or VFOC um, as a common language to argue about it. Basically, um, there we found that there are many schematic drawings to illustrate the potential of this process. However, not directly process models, no time depictions, no formal models. And so we said this is an interesting challenge, uh, especially since we have of course, a complex process domain. I only br briefly skipped over it, but I hope you can imagine that uh, I left out many, many details. And you have seen even with the simple depiction before, there are multiple kinds of interactions. What we also have, I spoke about iterative approaches, and we have, of course, still a linear project. So we have intermixing of life cycles of, uh, of iterations with varying frequency. This, this, very complex. And the question now that we set out to answer is, how can a business process reference model be designed to describe this domain? Uh, and can or should this even be done using a formal business process modeling language? With the goal, of course, that reference process models are always there for. Basically, we want to support process understandings with people who are interested in virtual factory uh, operations commissioning and allow them the uh, easier adoption or customizing of this reference model and also allow for improvements to their processes and benchmarking. So classical aspects of reference process models. Our methodology in this uh, progress was to basically develop first a uh, reference model for the traditional or conservative commissioning process based on existing literature and models 
and then from there derive a reference model for this virtual aspect to capture all the aspects uh, there and uh, keep it comparable to the original ones um, in order to well allow for these kind of comparisons understandings especially for people who only know the classical approach and see what is the difference what is not and of course our model was again based on existing literature and related models but also based on interviews we did with experts who actually do things that could be considered virtual factory operations commissioning now i kind of skipped over uh, the adjective here subject orientation and uh, maybe you have answered uh, the questions now. So, Laura, if, can we show the results in some regards for this? Let's see, because, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, thank you very much. I hope everyone can see it as I do. Well, most people, uh, a, a third of people have never heard about it, and 57% uh, basically have heard about it on much, much more. And I think that requires at least a very short introduction to the whole thing. What about this kind of subject oriented thing? So thanks, Laura, um, because it's quite essential for this research. So uh, a quick introduction into regards of this paradigm of describing processes and subject orientation basically is based on human ways to convey information about things that happen about processes and when we talk about humans let me introduce max uh, who rolls this ball and forms basically the most simplest or essential process description we as humans use consisting of subject predicate and object um, all things that are existing in every single natural language in the world that human use to convey information about that and how do these relate to process descriptions? Well, uh, these SPO structures, we have, of course, the simple focusing only on verbs, on activities. The chaining of activities uh, works fine in simple process. Like if you go to a barber shop, then you can say wash, cut, style. Perfectly fine. No one asks about it. However, this is a very old description approach. And at least in description approaches for describing or for computers what to do, namely programming, for the last 30 years, this is not a main programming paradigm, but most programming languages widely used at least support the concept of object oriented programming, which, or at least description of process, which is kind of useful in this regard. However, it's akin to the passive tense. So um, it's more like say this ball can be rolled. And this leads to a problem that it allows you to leave off the subject, which if we think about it, is the most essential aspect of describing what's going on, especially if no context is giving. Almost every single language in the world, and the easiest to understand sentence structure, starts with a subject. It's for, it's, this is an indication that um, every process description, if it's supposed to understand to be, uh, is it supposed to be understood easily, uh, should start with a subject, at least if you're following this paradigm of subject orientation which is basically um, stating or subject orientation as a paradigm simply states that if you describe process, start with the active entities of this process. Who is doing what? These are the subject in the process. And only afterwards, you can describe then the passive data objects in form of yeah, data objects, data, depending on what domain you are, in form from messages, for example, everything that is to be done for, and after this is clear, after you have the S and the O, then you can come to the predicates or the verbs, the activities, and descri uh, describe what is happening. But all of these must belong to a subject or must be assigned to one who is doing what. You cannot have activities without this assignment. If this sounds familiar, of course, uh, swim lane approaches go into that direction because we need that. It's conceptually close to human language as I introduced it. And uh, but this is just the paradigm, the basic way of thinking. Now, in this regards, there are some words that you may have heard about. Of course, I just basically just told you the core sense of subject orientation as a paradigm, as a way of thinking. Um, the research in this direction is often uh, found under the term of subject oriented business process management, SBPM, which is, of course, a BPM approach using, making use of subject orientation or more akin to using the parallel activity specification scheme, which is basically the only 
explicitly uh, explicit subject-oriented process description language in the world, um, which does not mean you can model subject-oriently in other languages like BPMN. However, this is the only one that is explicitly subject-oriented. And how does it look like? Well, it's easy. We have uh, the language is split up into two diagram types. First is the so-called subject interaction diagram, where we say who is involved, the subjects and the what, the messages, so S and O's are given here. However, no temporal information, only that in this process, there can be customers and there can be a, a customer and there can be companies and what messages they can exchange or what data objects they can exchange. If the temporal aspect is needed, then we should drive into the individual subject behavior diagrams that each, each subject possesses, where uh, we have activities done uh, on its own, these yellow ones, activities of sending, giving information to someone else and activities of waiting, basically. This also enforces that this kind of interaction is important. I kind of skipped over it. But if you have actions and multiple actors in a process of multiple subjects, and of course, the interaction is important or and this is required in subjugation is one of the strong points that you're kind of forced to give this interaction a name to talk about it. Now, um, after this short introduction, maybe you have kind of guessed off that I kind of spoiled the whole result of our research because I used our reference process model to kind of introduce you to the whole idea of what we are talking about when we talk about virtual factory operations commissioning. So I don't need to explain this model. I've done so before. However, now it's hopefully not a surprise to you that behind at least these normal standard subjects, there's always a behavior diagram. I cannot show you every behavior diagram, but let's talk about this for design, for example, that actually does not, cannot show you here, but does not differ much from its original one. We only have here this virtual feedback loop for the designers that now can basically um, test their designs in a better virtual environment. So we have here this feedback loop. And of course, when later on, when the, uh, during commissioning, this digital model can still be used to test things without just having to send parts off to the real deployment team and uh, waiting there, but have pre-tested, virtually tested solutions to be sent as updates to the other ones, just to give you an idea about how this model is structured. The other behavior diagram I want, want to briefly show you is the, that of the virtual factory operations commissioning team, where we have basically this three kind of stages that are, of course, iteratively done. We have a stage where, of course, the model needs to be created in some steps. Then we have the actual virtually factory operations commissioning phase, where uh, the model, the created model is used to analyze problems with the design, uh, problems with the software, especially give feedback and continue here the loop until a point is reached where you most likely due to deadlines have to go out and commission it and then of course still before something is sent to the people in the field we still have here uh, a feedback loop still working on this model uh, until operations are successful now um the idea of the model is to be a reference however um as said before, virtual commissioning does not replace real commissioning. It simply cannot done so. The question now is, why should someone do this? How can we estimate the impact that real virtual factory operations commissioning can be done? People are saying it's quite good. You should do that. However, it's as mentioned before, you need experts. It's expensive. Um, so, uh, and if it's not magic, you still may find errors in the real deployment. Why should you invest in some things like this. In an ideal planning world, there are no mistakes to be made. You have no iterations. The process just runs through and everything is fine. And a good engineer will find mistakes early on, maybe an experienced one, even without virtual factory operations commissioning. So uh, one of the goals that we strive for was saying, OK, if we use PASS, if you use this for our reference model, it's a formal language, a simulatable language. So as we, we cannot present the whole thing here, but we have an in initial step, we have provided the model with certain estimations about um, runtime and choice chances, or rather we have provided both models, the original one and the virtual one, uh, uh, the model with virtual factory operations commissioning, and just give some early estimations, which basically at least the initial indication uh, 
with very conservative estimations, so to speak, uh, said, okay, if we apply this, you have lead time reduction of 50%, and even more important, uh, the on-site commissioning time may be reduced up to 75%, according to these models. It would need more time to discuss the details here. So um, this is basically future works to further drive into this, do some better estimations and check this, but this is an, basically an early outlook. Well, I will conclude with a brief discussion of our current model that you could also take a look online yourself. And we, for discussions, for evaluation, we use the framework of Tyler and Bandera. So uh, looking into first the syntactic quality of the model, and that is basically given due to the formal nature of PASS, uh, that also um, basically uh, allows us to make sure that there are no internal structural problems in this complex model. And so these criteria are covered. However, the simulation aspect and how valid that is, this is up to future works. Then this model needs, of course, a semantic quality that is further subdued into concept of relevance, where we say, of course, with these potentials that it has, it's a very relevant model, so to speak. It is, as far as we can tell, complete. However, this is always difficult to tell because no one can always everything, but we should cover every standard case that is to be found in literature regarding this. Um, then, of course, uh, the correctness is given and the consistency, as stated before, is also given as the model is not self contradictory due to its uh, ex uh, executability. Well, pragmatic issues are, of course, then as a third criteria of Tyler and Bandara, it's provided, uh, the model itself provides uh, documentation for this VFOG, uh, VFOG process and well, one of the advantage, disadvantages, of course, as subject notation is not an everyday notation. It kind of forces modelers or people using the model to familiarize themselves with these aspects. However, it's still a fixed formal notation standard, so this is basically hopefully uh, balanced. And uh, it's also a pragmatic issue since it's based on related reference model. This should be there. Um, well, limitations. Um, um, are not, uh, I mentioned most of these. Um, we hope to introduce the simulatable aspects in the future. And I think I mentioned everything important for now. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for discussions right now. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your presentation. Again, I would, would be interested in the motivation behind your work. Why did you exactly pick up this use case? Uh, since you already also mentioned that this is, let's say, specific. So uh, was there any involvement in a, a project or what was the motivation to exactly uh, pick up this and to define a reference model for it? Uh, well, the whole domain of virtual factory as is part of the research of my whole department, Institute for Information Management. And we had lots of discussions basically in together with industry partners who are into this field. And so it basically developed naturally to just engage this, to have something to teach students to and discuss, have something to have a unified approach to not get distracted and uh, yeah. And so we found that, that that's basically where we found here is something lacking. But uh, as most often in science, we kind of stumbled over this problem in our daily work. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Any questions related to subject oriented modeling? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So I would be also interested what you final or what you presented on your final slides was the evaluation of the quality of the framework and what about the requirements that the framework should fulfill. Um, which, which requirements do you mean in this regard, the requirements for the model? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the requirements as uh, derived from the basic needs any referential process model would need to be done. It must, must be understandable. It must be inherently correct. It should be understandable. People should accept it. This is what I think are requirements in general for a process model. And as I mentioned, uh, since we are 
on a domain where other literature exists, it should not contradict those literatures except with good explanations. So um, I think that is what I think are the cr most crucial requirements. What would you add? I was also thinking about extendable, extendability or modularity. Extendi oh yeah, um, maybe it's a good point. Uh, that's a very good point indeed. Um, well, the one thing is adaptability basically deriving if someone wants to create its own for his, his or her organization and uh, its own der derivative of this model of course this can be done by hand extensibility of the model is given partially i'm i'm using here for the model we used the uh, non-declarative parts the definition part of pass not the declarative ones so it's for now a uh, given one and while there is uh, the, the so the most extensibility comes from the inherent uh, modular much modular process structure that pass offers so basically um, adding new subjects individual areas that contain more detail about this kind of process if someone thinks that more details are necessary in certain regards is given there and should be easily done as uh, pass allows it um, there is uh, also some ideas about uh, using this kind of model as a kind of definition idea to come up to derive a model and say i adhere to this kind of model uh, to most regards with automatic checking but this is still research going on so but this is a way where you could say i want to extend the model with, uh, for my own approach otherwise it would be standard just go there change the original model with standard description means so basically yeah change workflows or so yeah i'm not, okay i hope i i found uh, i i i found good answer to uh, question. Yeah, yeah, so, no 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 it's fine okay any questions well, from the audience I'm sorry if this was really a kind of tour de force a little bit through the basic ideas of subject orientation, but uh, times restrictions are, of course, a thing. No, it's fine. So uh, another question um, from personal interest is, um, are there any techniques already to derive subject-oriented models from, from logs, like process mining is, is doing? Um, actually, I have a, a student thesis, final thesis running at the moment, driving the basic ideas. Um, there are limitations to it um, in regards that um, typical logs or example logs we found so far rarely contain the person doing it. And you will probably require in order to come up with subject oriented models from logs, you at least as far as I have an overview right now, first, you need at least logs that have information about who is doing what partially. And since sometimes people can change in these logs, you probably need some measurements that allow uh, some heuristics to say, okay, Tom, Maria and Paul are basically fulfilling the same role at this regard. So you can group certain activities together into one subject. Uh, but this is only a challenge so far and no um, algorithms existed that would allow to do that even even though uh, it's kind of the direction i want to go in the future especially due to what we've heard today and in the previous talks since of course process mining is the most relevant topic at the moment but from now for now it there is no approach that i know of so if the logs doesn't fit um subject oriented approach then maybe you have to change the systems or <laughs> um well i think in order since to derive the, the appropriate logs um well I, I suppose real life logs should always have a person at least in, 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 in process engines if there is a person or some other entity this should be locked of course if someone if you have classic logs where this information is not considered important because they are based on classical process logic then of course nothing can be done there is no magic that can say this activity is to be grouped and in the end you would end up without this grouping of activities from logs you would end up with each activity in one subject basically which kind of would defy the whole purpose of it you went end up with the same petrinet based uh, standard workflow <laughs> only that all activities are basically wrapped into subjects but yeah 
I suppose. Okay. I see a lot of future work. Indeed, uh, but this, <laughs> uh, yeah, but not for this one. This one is no, a referential no, no. process model, or this was a referential process model. Oh, yeah, okay. then, so, no thanks questions. Thanks for the question, the Agnes. Yes, it was nice to see you again. Um, just a greetings to my alma mater. <laughs> Um, yeah, then I to my like old uh, lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, then I would like to close the session. Uh, very nice um, talks and hope to see you soon physically, um, maybe next year at the conference. And then uh, enjoy your day. And Laura, should I hand over to you now? Yeah, well, good. Yep, I can close the session down. <laughs>